Well, I gave you in the bulletin and I gave the announcement that uh, the sermon tonight would be taken from Judges chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Now, I'll tell you up front, it is a topical message. I seem like uh, in my old age, I'm getting more of those. Uh, but this is a seven-point uh, topical message on our seven areas of strength. Here it is in Judges chapter 16. Here you have uh, Samson, who's the strongest man in the world. He can tear down stone gates and carry them to the top of the mountain. He can later tear down pillars and destroy a whole uh, more people in that one instant than he killed with the jawbone of an ass and all the other things that he had strong, but he had areas of weakness. And I want to show you that. I hope that uh, no one here would have this area, but there are areas of weakness that you have. And for you not to recognize that and to make compensations to not let those areas keep you. And you think old smutty face doesn't know where your weak areas are. Here it is. Delilah is her name. Verse number four. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Lots of things are wrong here. She's not a Jew. She's not a godly person. She's in a, a group of people that are very, very sinful. And he goes over there to find her. Well, we jump all the way over to verse six, verse 6. And he's having a love affair with her. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth. That's the verse I gave this morning. Tell me wherein thy great strength lieth. We'll look at a little of this. Samson toyed with her. He said, if they buy me with seven green widths. Now that's strands of grass. And width means very thin and very weak strands of grass. If you buy me with seven green widths, that have never been dried, then shall I be weak and be as other men. Then the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths, which had been dried, and she bound him with them. Now, it's not telling you each time she did this, she got him drunk so he would go to sleep. She tied his hands with seven green widths. And uh, now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber, she said to him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. <laughs> and he break the widths as a thread of tow, uh, a piece of uh, thread, is broken. When it touches the fire, it's really gone. So his strength was not known. And he got up and took care of them. Delilah said to Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Now, right about here, he should have bound her and thrown her out the back door. But no, he wasn't smart enough to do that. And he said to her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that have never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as other men. So, same story all over again. Delilah said, Up, up, the Philistines are here. So he rose up and he broke the... Uh, he broke them with his arm like a thread. She cried again, why, are you, why do you keep lying to me? Wouldn't you think at some point he'd have figured it out? Well, I don't have the right time to read them all till we get over here. And, uh, and he told her the truth. Let me see where I'm at here. Uh, yeah, verse number 19. Verse number 18. When Delilah saw that he told her of his heart, he, verse number 17, and he told her all of his heart and said to her, there, that, that thou come not a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. And if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like other men. By the way, that, you see these pictures of Jesus with long hair? This is where it comes from. It's not in here. He didn't say a haircut. He said a razor. A razor that would shave me bald like 
a few of the heads I'm looking at this today. Uh, if you shave me bald, my strength is in my hair. He told her the truth. In verse 18, when Delilah saw he had told her all his heart, she went and called for the lords of the Philistines, said, come up here at this once. And they showed me his heart. And the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and brought money in, her, in their hand. That's what she wanted. She made him sleep uh, upon her knees. She called for a man who came, uh, causing him to shave the seven locks of his head. And she began to, uh, and she began to afflict uh, him, and his strength went from him. She said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He awakened out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before, shook himself and whisked, oh, underline this, and he wished not that the Lord had departed from him. He gave in to Delilah, gave up the truth, and lost everything. How, how be it the hair of his head, you need this verse, began to grow again right after he was shaven is what that says. He didn't need much, and you know the story. He's locked up. He's uh, blinded. He's pulling what the what the oxen would pull, and and they got him all chained and beat him half to death. And he tells the little boy, "Show me the pillars that hold this building up. Not show me, but lead me to them." I don't understand that how they could have been that close, but he was able to get a hold of two pillars, blind. But his hair had just begun to grow back, and he pulled. And those pillars came down, and he killed more men when that building fell down than all the men he killed in his ministry died in that building. Well, there's a lesson to be learned here, and the lesson is to find your areas of strength and not kid yourself about other things. It's amazing to me how many people pick other things as, this is my strength, but it has nothing to do with God. Your strength comes from God, and it's not your hair, and it's not long hair, although it does mention locks. Jews wore locks. It didn't mention scissors. It said he was shaved bald, and the minute the hair began to grow, his strength came back. So this Nazarite thing, Jesus had long hair, get out of here. He no more did that. In fact, the Bible said, does not even nature itself you tell you if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him. The word in that word shame is sin. It's a shame to him for a man to have women's hair. So ah, I get so irritated over that. Well, there are seven areas of strength that you need to guard. Let me give them to you. God's grace is one of your areas of strength. Did you know that? Right down behind it, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. Other verses with it. Drop down a little bit, put a number two. And this is kind of a fun one. Clean hands. Clean hands are an area of strength. Now, it obviously has an analogy. What clean hands represent to you are what, in the spiritual realm, are things they relate to God. That's Job 17.9. Here's the best one. Put an asterisk by it. To be aware of your own weakness. Boy, it's hard for especially for we men, to ever own up to having weaknesses. Listen, you, you can be your best for God when you finally own up to that. That's Psalm 73 and verse number 26. This was Samson's problem, by the way. And then number four is just to wait on the Lord. And that's Isaiah 40, 31. I can quote that one. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Every verse here says that God's grace will renew your strength. Clean hands will renew your strength. Being aware of your own weakness will renew your strength. And learning to wait on the Lord. <laughs> we, we get now in front of him. And when you do that, don't you know God just stops and says, let me know when you need some help and I'll come and help you. What, what a sorry thing to do. Number five, claiming God's promise. I guess I should say the non-strength of that is not claiming. We, we do things our way. But when we claim God's strength, promises, pardon me, it becomes our strength, Romans 4 and verse 20. 
these won't be long. Number six, abide, boy, this gets preached here a lot, doesn't it? Abiding in the word. You ought to shame yourself at times for how many verses of scripture you don't know. And, and to not let yourself get content with not learning any more scripture. Thy word have I hid in my heart. What is that? That's memory. That I might not sin against God. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Abiding in God's word. 1 John 2.14. And then lastly, I really like this one. It's in a number of other sermons of things that it does. The joy of the Lord. Right down there, Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. If you walk in the flesh... You let everything in your flesh sidetrack you and you get down over that and you lose the joy of the Lord. Watch it. Old smutty face is going to be right there and he'll send Delilah to say, Up, up, you Philistines. Get him now because he's lost the joy of the Lord. Father, I thank thee for these seven. I have to be reminded of them. Our folks need to do the same. I pray there'd be folks here tonight that put this in the front of their Bible. Mark it in ink. Put all seven of them and put it at the top, the seven things needed to enjoy the strength of the Lord. Bless the message. I'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't take a long time. The first thing, and it is number one, no doubt about it. You wouldn't put it anywhere else, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9 and 10. If there's anything you and I need to have evident in our life is that we live by the grace of God. God's grace. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, I'm getting, spending a little extra time here getting to 12. There it is. And verse 9 and 10, the context will show itself. Uh, Paul is mentioning to God some areas uh, uh, that he's glorying in himself and that kind of thing. He's apologizing to the Lord. And verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that he might take it from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I got a letter, red letter Bible, and those last words are in red. That's a quote from the Lord Jesus Christ. My grace is sufficient for thee. Why? For my strength is is made perfect in your weakness. And, and there'll be times when we'll want to stand for the Lord, but we're not standing in his strength. We're standing in our strength, and it'll never work. It didn't work for Samson, and it won't work for you, and it won't work for me. What is God's grace? God giving us what we don't deserve. God's mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Now, the kind of life we live, God, the only way we survive is where God's merciful. But when you understand you can't do it, then God will take your weakness and replace it with his strength, and you can accept God's grace and be able to do strong things for the Lord. I'm not going to go to other verses too much, but I need to do Psalm 147 and 140 and verse 7 here real quick. Uh, Psalm 140. And let's hope I can get to these real quick. I don't want to have to take an awful lot of time. Here we go. Uh, 140 and verse number 7. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Put the helmet on. It's the helmet of God. Thou coverest my head in the day of battle. Your strength is my salvation. Not so much just being saved, but your salvation to get out of a jam. You get yourself in a problem, and this is the one that's often recognized like this. When you do this when you're praying, sometimes if you're troubled, and I don't want to get our church started with every time we turn around where that's Pentecostalism. But you know something, I, I, I see, I very seldom ever see any reaction to an invitation. Of any kind, certainly not walking an aisle. It just is done in this church. In all my years I've been here, only once or twice have I ever seen people down here. But if you're carrying a burden, and all of a sudden you realize you've got to have the grace of God to replace it, or you haven't figured that out yet, 
during the invitation while no one's looking around, you do this. I'm not, if I see it, I'm not going to say anything. No one else is supposed to be looking. And if they do, it's not their business. But God's watching. God knows if you're relying on the grace of God to get you through, and this is how you show him. The Bible says lifting up holy hands. That's what that's about. What do open hands say to God? I can't. But you can. I can. But you can. And you end up trusting the Lord. Right down there, 1 John 4, 4, that goes with this. The grace of God, do, do I need to say more on the grace of, on that? Uh, the grace of God is that which God produces in your life to get you out of a problem or to solve a problem or to take you to the next level that you could not have done by yourself. And you stand back and look at it and say, God did that. I've told you stories of my life. My wife gets tired of me telling those stories. But years ago, I never planned on ever doing this. Wasn't it wasn't even close to my mind. She'd go to bed, and I had a little office in her apartment. And I'd go in there and study and read, and, and then I'd stop in prayer. Four nights in a row, I'd get on my knees next to my big chair, and all I could say was, Oh, God. Oh, God. And, man, I mean, this thing just overwhelmed me. And I'm weeping on my chair and scared. What is this? Four nights. The, the third and fourth night, I did not want to get on my knees. I did not want to. But by the same token, I wanted to know what this was. The third night, same thing. The fourth night, same thing. Fourth night, as I said, and the other night, oh, God, I am weeping tears. And I'm, I'm calling out to God. And I don't know what God wants. The next day, I know I've told you. But do you have some things that have happened in your past that literally motivate you, that literally help keep you in the track? This one does for me. You know how many times pastors over the years have said, you know, I, I just need to walk out of here. I just need to get out of the way and let someone else do it. It's a bad place for a preacher to be. But truthfully, there are times I think, hey, nobody listening, nobody cares. Nobody, nobody, you know, let somebody else do it. You seem to know more than I know. And I'm the guy who's supposed to be getting the direction from God. The next day I walk in the house. I, by the time I'm at the door, I'm a businessman. But when I got to the kitchen, I'm a preacher. Somewhere between the door and the kitchen, which is a living room about 13 feet, 12, 13 feet wide, God called me to preach. I stepped in the kitchen. She was never expecting me to say this. I looked at her. I said, honey, it's time to go. And we hadn't been there very long. I was a successful manager in Seattle, Washington, just a couple of years. I said, it's time to go. God just called me to preach. <laughs> and how long ago was that, preacher? Well, more than 54 years, because I've been doing this 54 years. And let me tell you up front, I could not have done this but for the grace of God. And there have been times when God said, send an angel, slap me up the wrong side of the head. And God said, get out of the way. I'm performing my grace. Shut up and let me. Well, he doesn't speak like that. But you have to know where, where the weaknesses are in your life so you can let God work through those. And if you sit there in your flesh and say, and, and some of you might do that. I don't have any areas like that. Well, don't get close to me. Because the day God throws a bolt of lightning at you, I don't want to get hit with the overspray. Man, listen. If you, if you, when you think you can, <laughs> you can't. And you need areas where it's the grace of God. You can't do it. Notice the second one, Job 17. Just go over uh, back a couple of more books here. Uh, Job chapter 17. How about that? I got there pretty quick. And verse number 9, we're looking for the word strength. The righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be strong, stronger, and stronger. I said strong at first. He that hath 
clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Well, you get the type of that. Your, your hands are dirty. David and I were working on that furnace this morning trying to get it going. I'm glad he got dirtier than I did. <laughs> I, I shoved him in there first and let him get the dust out of the way. We became out of there with dust all over us. Had to go wash our hands. You know, he that hath clean hands, it's a type. This is a type. You, you look, Mom always said, let, let me check you before we go to the dinner table. Ah, Joyce used to do that to our kids. Only she didn't just check your hands. Check behind your ears and this and that. And Mom would say, get in that bathroom and use the soap this time. And don't come back in here again till your hands are clean. When you came back, you got an inspection. And if you didn't do it right the second time, guess who washed it for you? Mom went back with you, and you didn't like the way she scrubbed your hands. You have to have clean hands. You can't have the world all over you. And that's what this is a picture of. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. I'll give you this in real fast. Then I won't uh, pick too many other scriptures uh, for support of this. I'll just tell you where they're at. You can look them up. 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse number 12. Here I am. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So you have the eyes and the ears that are open to the Lord. But the Lord's face is against those that do evil. So we could stick with that. Show me your hands. Show me your hands. God seeing that you are not mixing the world. You, you love the world. Uh, you can't love the world and love God. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man hath the love of the world, the love of, the gods, of God is not in him. How does God see that? Clean hands. And there it is. It's the second area. Make sure, if you, even if you have to fake it and look at your hand, to make the analogy, is there anything in me that isn't clean that God sees? And I'm not talking about a little dirt on your hand. I'm talking about dirt that's in your mind or dirt sin that's gotten into your life. If we confess our sin. Now, how could God say that if you don't have any sin? If you say you don't sin, you do lie and do not the truth. You are a liar you're sitting here tonight and you're saved and you say, I don't sin. Stay away from me. You are a liar. I'm the pastor and I can get in the flesh. You don't believe me? Ask that dear lady sitting over there. One of the hardest things in this old age is not letting that override you. To try to find some way. And the best way that's often not heard is just to apologize. Get it out of the way and get on with it. And it's pictured in the clean hands. Uh, here's the third one, Psalm 73 and uh, uh, verse number 26. Psalm 73. That was easy to get to as well. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is my the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now, it didn't say of your flesh, because there's no good thing that dwells in your flesh. When you got saved, the only thing that didn't get saved is your flesh. Your soul, your spirit can be united with God through the presence of the Comforter in John 15 through 16, all the way over to almost 17. The four relationships of the Holy Spirit give you that ability to be aware, to be aware of your relationship with the Lord. And uh, let's look at that verse again, verse 26. My flesh... It's going to cause you problems. And as a result, my heart faileth. But God, it's almost, he said, forget your flesh. God is the strength of your heart and my portion forever. If you keep your heart right with God, God will let you then keep your flesh in, in relationship with God. And it'll be a lot easier to walk with God. So you want to make sure you have a tender heart. You know, uh, we we do that with the world. Do, do you ever hear a sermon that puts tears in your eyes? You know, I don't ever see that here much. 
Uh, boy, I loved, I loved evangelism. Watch people come. See, this was always called the mourner's bench in churches, mainly the one in the middle down front. Nobody sat there on purpose. During the invitation, the preacher would be preaching about, uh, uh, pick simple ones, about sucking on a silly cigarette and what it can do to your life. And some guy's sitting there that smells like smoke. His fingers are even yellow. He doesn't know that everybody in the room can smell him. But all of a sudden, God gets a hold of his heart. In the old days, he'd look at his hand. That's one of the quick, I smoked for a long time. It took a long time to get that stain off my hand. And, he, and he's looking at his hand. Tears are filling his eyes. He got up and he walked to the mourner's bench. And he stood in front of the mourner's bench. And when they were seated, he sat at the empty mourner's bench. Now out here in the crowd is a guy like me that's had stained fingers. Not so much the preacher, but having victory over smoking, when the invitation was given, that man walked down to sit next to this man because he knew why he had come. Why? Because the church been praying for the guy that he'd get victory. It's almost like we play a game today. I know you have sin in your life, but I know you know I have sin in my life. And if you won't bother me about my, your sin, I, my sin, I won't bother you about your sin. And we think we can play that old game I never can pronounce. Ollie, ollie, oxen free. We're going to get away with some friend. You've never gotten away with anything in the presence of God. God never loses. You want to get kicked out of God's presence? You got some of these that are weaknesses to you? Leave them there and watch what happens. Anytime you've heard a sermon and it deals with you and you don't deal with it, you leave yourself in a position for God to come and do some things. And notice the, the fourth one, God's grace, clean hands, being aware of your own weakness. By the way, you could put below that, this was Samson's problem. Samson's problem started because he said to his own parents, take me down to the village of the Philistines so I can find a woman. That'd be like a Christian mother being told by the son, take me down on on large Larimer Street, I had a mission down there once. Take me down at 21st and Larimer, and I'm going to find me a woman. Oh, yeah, you're going to find a woman. They took him, and that's where he's at. Delilah's one of those women, and the fool's down there, and, and he's out of God's will. Samson problem was not willing to acknowledge his own weakness. And when he had his strength, boy, look at the things he could do. Well, number four is some... Uh, 40 and uh, Psalm 40 and verse 31. Did I write down uh, Isaiah? Isaiah, pardon me. Isaiah 40, 31. Good night. You have this to memory. Surely you have this to memory. I'm going to turn there because I have it to memory. I don't need it. I'm going to look up and ask how many of you didn't need to turn to that because you already know this verse. Amen. Keep it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. What's the message? Knowing your areas of strength. One of your areas of strength is learning to not run ahead of God and learning to not run behind God. You want those two? First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, forgive us our sin. Running ahead and running behind are pictured in verse 8 and verse 10. The, if, I, if you say you have not sinned, and the second one, I always misquote that one. And in between is, Lord, this is me. And that goes back to the, uh, in evangelism. We always, if I was in the church, I designate. Don't, I tell the preacher, don't let anybody sit there. We're going back to the mourner's bench. Took a few nights before it caught on. But man, here folks had come. Sometimes nobody would come to sit with them. But I would. After service over, I'd go tell this person, wait over here a minute. I'd go over here to this one. Let me pray with you. Now tell me, I bet I guessed the need because I knew when you came. Is this the need? And, and what I said earlier, most of the people sitting on that bench had tears running down their face. And, and the old southern preacher evangelist said, you know what you need in a message? You need God to squeeze your heart so hard that the juice runs out your eyes. You ever wonder where tears come from? God squeezing your heart. 
and they're related. As your heart is moved toward God, tears will flow down your face. And we ought not be ashamed of that. That's something that would bring us to an altar. It would scare me to go week after week and never have God speak to my heart and never have a reason to yield to God and, and just to wait on him to do something. Well, right down there, 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 7, and there's an illustration uh, where uh, what, it was Elijah uh, had to wait on the Lord. He, he said, uh, I think I'm in the right text, he said to the, the queen's out to kill me and nobody's standing with me and I just want you to kill me and take my life. God fed him. God did some other things with him. Then he sent him up a mountain and put him in a cave. While he's inside that cave, an earthquake came. God wasn't in that. And a strong wind came, but God wasn't in that. And finally, something else came and God wasn't in that. He's standing in that cave and all these scary things and none of them are God. What happened? All of a sudden, a still, small voice said, Elijah, Elijah. And he heard the voice of the Lord because he was waiting on the Lord. You've got other examples, Elijah and Elijah. When they crossed the, you remember, Elijah's first, he has a J, and Elijah is second because he has an S in his name. Elijah taking Elijah, Elijah taking Elisha to cross the river. And Elisha, in turn, coming back, crossing the river. All of those are pictures of Elisha learning how to wait on the Lord. And, and when he finally asked uh, Elijah, Elijah said, what do you want me to ask God to give you? He said, I want a double portion of what you have. And Elijah looked at him and said, man, I, I, I'll ask him, but I don't know if he'll do it. Now, I've never checked it. Isn't that funny? In all these years, but I'm told that you can find that Elijah did nine miracles and Elisha did 18. Someday I'll try to look it up, but I do know Elisha did greater miracles and more miracles than Elijah did because he learned to wait upon the Lord. Man, what, what's this point? Put an asterisk by. This is seeing God do something. Don't, don't wait for God to have you motivate something. Wait on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the song says, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Notice the extra number five, Romans chapter four and verse number 20. How about that? I turned right to it. Romans chapter four and verse number 20. I said that and I'm in chapter three. There it is. Uh, this is Abraham, and in verse 19, he said, Abraham, not being not weak in faith, considered not his own body now dead. This God telling a 100-year-old man that he's going to have a child and if by his 90-year-old wife. Uh, 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 when he was about 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. Look at verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Can you imagine? I, I think you would be giving glory to God while you're trying to stay out of arm reach your wife who has a club in her hand. She's 90 years old and she's pregnant from a 100-year-old man. And only happened for one reason, because Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him for faith, for strong faith and claiming God's promise. There's another weakness. Just never claim a promise. Never see a verse that promises you something and to claim that promise. Well, if you don't memorize scripture, you'll never have anything to claim. And you ought to sit down sometime. You want to find a weakness, sit down and see how many scriptures you really know that you can quote exactly with address and location. The, the verse in the book and quote the verse with punctuation, everything correct. How, how many, you know, from my years of traveling in, in the, I hate saying this, the average Christian can't write a hundred verses with punctuation and location correctly without looking it up. A hundred? 
a hundred four three hundred and forty three thousand words in the Bible making made up from uh, oh good now now I forgot how many verses uh, uh, tw- uh, uh, 100, 1200 chapters and and all all those all those words and not even have a hundred of them memorized and we went when we were kids years ago I wasn't but the kids that grew up in church you got a a little you wore a medallion for your scripture verses and you got a, another one to put under it and it went down in front of your coat and they had a song that we used to sing and it said uh, but I stopped short never to go again for I tripped on my long uh, uh, but anyway it was so long he tripped on it and fell well anyhow I messed that joke up that was how kids learn scripture they would have these list of all the verses they know hanging down on front of their coat hundreds and hundreds of verses nowadays here's what we say well it says somewhere in the bible oh man don't ever say that unless you can say how about the one from the other day second chronicles uh good night now losses uh, uh 1826 is that what it was uh at par bar westward fort to causeway and to at par bar now, how would you know that verse if you didn't get it from me? <laughs> but I memorized that verse years ago. Claiming God's promise, Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The one that was in the Bible last week, Matthew 7, 7, and today was Matthew 7, 8. Uh, not, uh, I always get them out of order. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be open. Uh, you've given three of those, and, and here they are. You find the word of God and you claim that as a promise from God and say, I'm going to live this verse. The minute you don't do that, oh, smutty face, and that's the purpose of sermon. Uh, be sober. Somebody know this verse? Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the Lord, so that he'll flee from you. I messed up the end of the verse. But that's the verse. That's where all of this leads. Each one of these, Delilah, becomes a picture of Satan. And Satan's looking for you to not know the grace of God. He's looking you for you. He's checking your hands to see if your hands are dirty. He's checking to see if you're aware of where your weaknesses are because that's where he's going to attack you. He's wanting to see if you're waiting on the Lord or you're just running on your own gas tank. Boy, he wants you and he'll get you. He's watching to see if you've claimed any promises from God. Boy, I, I wish I had kept a record of all the areas of promises where I asked God for something and he did it and he gave it and he blessed it. Here's the next one quickly. First John 2, 14. Uh, let's look at it real fast, mainly because I just forgot it. <laughs> First John, when the preacher says, let's look this one up, you know he just forgot it. First John 2 and verse 14. I have written unto you fathers uh, because you know him this from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you, so that you have overcome the wicked one. I'm writing you, young men, because you were strong. How did he do it? By abiding in God's word. Abiding in God's word will keep you strong. Uh, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God's faithful. He will not suffer to be tempted above what you're able. Watch it. But will with the temptation provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Where does the escape come from? A scripture verse. Thy word have I hid in my heart. An old smutty face comes up to get you, and you're quoting a verse that stops him cold. He has to turn, and I like that name. He hates me when I use it, but that's what he is, old smutty face, the devil. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And I like to quote this one. You know, I have many things to say to you, but they're hard to be uttered uh, because you uh, because of your understanding. Uh, when for the time you ought to be able to 
Oh, good night. Now I've lost the verse. When for the time, uh, let me let me catch that real quick. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I, good night. I know this verse inside now. I've used it so many times. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to utter, seeing that you're dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again those things which be the first principles of the oracles of God and have come, become as those who have need of milk and not strong meat. For strong meat belongeth to those who are full age, to those who by reason of use have had their senses exercised. That's strength to do, to know both good and evil. And so abiding in God's word gives you the strength to turn to Satan and say, not here, you can't, you can't come in here. That, that verse in Philippians 4, it's not in this message. Uh, finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure. And he names eight things, six and then two more, if there be any virtue, any praise. With those eight things, fix your mind on these things. The Greek word fix your mind is build a wall. Trump wanted to build that wall. God tells you to build a wall with those eight things around yourself. Said old smutty face can't get in to get you off track. That's abiding in God's word. And then the last one, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 10. The end of the verse, I won't turn there. It says, uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Uh, that was the Isaiah verse. And then this one says, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The last one is to live with the joy of the Lord. Are you ashamed of God? Does it bother you that God wants so much space with you? Does it, does it trouble you that you can't always have your own way? If you always have your own way, don't brag to anybody about your Christianity. Brother, you live for God, and you wait for God to say, Whom shall I send, and who shall go for me? And when you're doing these seven things, you'll be able to answer and say, Lord, here am I, send me. If you can't do that, I'll raise my hand and say, Here am I, send David. <laughs> here, here am I, send, send Dave. Send Matt. Send somebody else. I don't want to go. Now you're like Samson. All these things point back to him. You know the joy of the Lord. Proverbs 15, 15, 13 goes with this. Uh, Habakkuk 3, 18 and 19. Uh, Do whatever it takes to please the Lord. The joy of the Lord comes because you're pleasing him. And at some point, the Lord says to the angel, Hey, hey, stop a minute. Look what brother or sister so-and-so is doing. You know how long I've prayed for them to do that? And angels are looking over God's shoulder. And sure enough, you're doing something that pleases the Lord, like sharing the gospel, learning a verse, going to an extra service, uh, being a witness to someone, all the various things. And you're making God happy, the joy of the Lord. Here's a song and I'll close. This is a verse somebody wrote, a song somebody wrote, and it's from that verse. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's verse 1. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's verse 2. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Verse 3. Wait till you hear verse 4. The joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> oh, there's another verse. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. Oh, watch it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Usually about now, at least somebody in the crowd is mouthing it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Father, thank you for the message. It's not funny, I know, because this muddy face knows every area that we have weakness in these seven areas that we're supposed to have strength. My, how good it would be if we had 
written those down and we take the time to review them and really see where our strength is and to do the things necessary to make us stronger in the areas of our strength. That was that Hebrews 11 text. God help us to be able to walk in step and in favor with thee so that you would say to the host of heaven, see my servant, he or she is my joy. God help us to be the joy of the Lord. I'll give thee praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnal and turn to number 272. The joy. That's not in here. <laughs> 272. Just one verse. And this is about that sermon. Jesus, I come. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus I come, Jesus I come, into thy freedom, gladness and light, Jesus I come to thee, out of my sickness, to thy health out of my want and in to thy wealth out of my sin and in to thyself Jesus I come to thee well walk with the Lord this week and do remember Thursday and say thank you to a veteran you they have illustrations in there uh, even with policemen kind of getting off the track but doing a nice thing if you know a veteran buy their lunch if you take them out to lunch do something to say to that person thank you for your service if no more than just say that thank you for having served the Lord especially if it's a relative or a friend give them a call on Veterans Day and thank them for their uh, labor for our country and the things that they've done.